The Mastercase H500M by Cooler Master sports dual 200mm addressable RGB fans, a USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C port, and four tempered glass side panels, both sides, top, and front, and the front can swap out for a mesh panel if you want maximum airflow. It has a plethora of cable routing covers to keep things tidy too, so click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. What's up guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today, I have JJ back in my garage one more time. How's it going, JJ? I'm doing good, man. Excellent. Uh, JJ offered to come back because he wanted to show off some laptops. And I had this question that popped in my head that I, I've been asked a lot of times, and maybe you guys have asked it at home, which is, why can't you build your own laptop? I build my own desktop computers all the time. And aside from a very niche area where you can get some laptops that have some upgrade possibilities, it's really impossible. Now, this video is gonna be about telling you guys why it's impossible. It's not gonna be about telling you guys how to build your own, because that's probably not going to be a thing. <laughs> We're going to be featuring this new laptop from Asus, uh, which, is, which is the Asus ROG Zephyrus, actually the Zephyrus S, a new laptop in the Zephyrus line. It's got the uh, six core Intel Coffee Lake processor in there, as well as a bunch of design work that's been built into it in order to make it a functional gaming laptop without like overheating and melting, I guess. So yeah, it's the world's <laughs> thinnest gaming laptop, and that in thinnest. itself, I think, is really the reinforcement of what you're talking about, and is that when you talk about thin and when you talk about about high performance, they're generally exclusive. Um, and that's what we're hopefully gonna be able to give you guys some insight into is that how do we achieve uh, being able to have this level of performance in something that is essentially, you know, 0.7 inches in terms of it at its thickest point and, you know, 4.6 pounds. It is very thin and with the amount of hardware in here, which obviously generates heat, different techniques have been developed in order to help dissipate that heat. And uh, the original Zephyrus, which was a Max-Q laptop, which is a standard that Nvidia has developed to make sure that their laptops made for gaming with Nvidia graphics cards integrated can mm -hmm. operate at high performance while not being incredibly loud but can also be thin and light and still function like a portable laptop should. So Asus with the original Zephyrus had this design here where when you actually lift the lid uh, it sort of creates some some gaps down yep. here at the bottom it spaces out and that just allows air and heat to dissipate from under there. Uh, I like what's been done with the cooling arrangement on here because you also have a bunch of intake areas up here at the front. I originally thought that these were like exhaust and it was going to yep. be kicking hot air up at you um, but what some of the the considerations that have been gone in uh, that, that have gone into creating this design. Um, so actually, I think you talked about it already a little bit. Is that one of the key hallmarks that you have with the Zephyrus is really about being quote unquote like a ultra premium thin and light gaming laptop, and this has traditionally not really been the case. You could get kind of a certain level of thickness, a certain level of performance, but you couldn't really get to this. I think originally, I think the goal was always being sub five pounds, and now we're not just going about sub five pounds, right? We're really being definitely below that marker. We're going very thin, um, but you don't want to compromise on things like the rigidity. You don't want to compromise on the thermal performance. So how do we achieve that? Well, you noted one of the first hallmarks of the Zephyrus is gonna be the active airflow design. And that's essentially when you go ahead and you open up the unit. So if we go ahead and just drop down the panel, and we pull up, you see that that expands. And once that actually expands, that allows us to bring significantly more airflow into the system. But that's really only one element to this, right? As we're bringing airflow in, uh, we also need to have actually a large, actually thermal assembly or thermal mm -hmm. solution. And actually we have actually the raw thermal solution here, which you can kind of get a sense of how this has been designed and developed. So this generation actually is quite a bit more advanced than our previous generation. The original Zephyrus only had uh, two actually heat sink assemblies. And now we have a total of four heat sink assemblies, two 250 fins, an advanced uh, copper framework that goes here. So there are shared heat pipes between the CPU and the GPU, but also still independent heat pipe for the CPU and GPU, and even dedicated heat pipe and uh, actually thermal coverage for the actual power circuitry. So we've tried to look at really every single element to be able to ensure that the thermal performance um, stays consistently at or around about 80 degrees. In some situations, if the ambient's even cooler, or if you're leveraging the turbo performance option mode within the fan setting profiles, you're gonna be able to get better than that. Um, but that's really the goal, right, is that if you're going to be putting in such a high performance CPU, a high performance GPU, you don't want to be throttling. You don't want to be losing that performance, uh, even though you've got this thin and light based design. So then itself was quite challenging because when you go about to something like this, you have to really look at the density of the fins. So mm. 250 fins that we have in here. So there's a lot of fins in there. And even the placement, when you talk about essentially all the air points that you have here, right, you've got exhaust here, we've got intake that's going to be here, right? You've got actually also exhaust, 
exhaust over here is that we even had to carefully design um, the actual exhaust here on these heat sinks to actually be slightly angled and vented mm -hmm. at an angular uh, level. And the reason why you want to be able to have something like that is, of course, is that if you're gaming and you've got your hand, let's say, in this position, you don't want to essentially have hot air creating sweaty hands, right? Because oh, yeah. sweaty hands, you know, you're, you're trying to keep a hold of your mouse and it's just going to be a bad situation all the way around. We had to carefully look at all these subtle aspects and they really helped to provide, I think, a much higher level of performance. And that's why we have this quote unquote non-traditional design where you have, of course, the keyboard brought out to the front. So that allows us to have significantly more intake airflow, which complements the entirety of this thermal solution. But you also then get other benefits. You know, one of the nice things about this type of design is you have more of a desktop stance where I can put my hand right here. It's resting against the actual table. And it's, it seems a little bit more natural than sometimes having to throw my hand all the way up here mm -hmm. and then have maybe my mouse hand outside here. So it just gives you a little bit of a different kind of design and placement that you got to get used to. But you can see that everything we've consciously designed for a certain benefit, a certain value. I was going to mention, especially like if the laptop is heating up, if you're playing a long gaming session or something, then having your hands off of the keyboard yep. might help keep them a little bit cool as well. Yeah, keep, no, so keeping your hands cool. This, this area definitely is going to be significantly cooler because of the way that we've done that designed that thermal solution and continuing on that thermal solution before we get, I think, to some of the other kind of design hallmarks that we've got here um, is actually going to be what work that we've done here with um, the actual fans themselves. And so this is something that's really quite complex and challenging when you talk about notebook based design. And so I know when we were talking about this, just kind of giving you a little briefing and insight, um, it was interesting because you were asking me, are the fans essentially the same type of technology that you have in the new uh, latest generation Noctua fans? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why we kind of brought that up is that the actual fans themselves are comprised of liquid crystal polymer and you need the rigidity of liquid crystal polymer because we've got 83 fan blades that are present here. So these are 12 volt fans so they spin at a significantly higher level RPM to be able to provide us more airflow and more performance. But when you're essentially at that level of RPM, right, you don't want to have actually any uh, misalignment or you don't want to have any type of deformation that might occur to the actual fan blade itself. And mm -hmm. so that allows us to maintain a really high level of performance. So that's a really cool design element that we've, again, had to kind of consider goes, how can we help to maximize that airflow performance being provided to the actual thermal solution? And so that was achieved by utilizing it. And actually, the first Zephyrus was the first notebook ever to implement that type of design technology. And so we've continued on with this generation. We've just increased the number of fins compared to the original Zephyrus, which was, I believe, uh, 71 or 73. Now we've got 83, so even more. So you're saying that if I wanted to build my own laptop, that I uh, probably just couldn't go and buy this type of uh, <laughs> cooling solution off the shelf. Correct. Uh, so the proprietary design, it's it's made in such a way that everything is packed in very, very close, very tight, but also you have to have cooling efficiency throughout. So this is probably the main reason why you couldn't, you know, buy a, a, an empty frame for yep. something like that and install your own hardware. But the flip side is that you get the benefits of all of this design work and engineering that's gone into it. So you can have a laptop that you can actually game on, that you can take on the go, that's, you know, it's going to get warm while it's uh, while you're gaming on it or, or doing video editing and stuff, but it's also going to dissipate that heat and also direct it away from you. I appreciate yeah. that. And actually speaking of direction, one of the other kind of cool design elements that we had here is, again, you know, something that you might not necessarily think about, but people think about like when they're building a traditional system is managing dust, right? And so even that's something that we have to think about here because in a lot of these situations, you might not actively be cleaning this unit. So how do you ensure that the thermal solution is going to maintain its uh, kind of level of performance over time? Mm -hmm. And so we actually had to create a specialized, essentially internal housing. It's kind of a self-cleaning design where through the centrifugal force and the actual speed that you have uh, in terms of that channeling effect for the air that as it comes in, there's actually a separate channel that exists right here within the actual fan housing that allows the actual dust, debris, and particulate matter, so like dust, debris, dander, uh, things like that will essentially be channeled and exhausted outside the system as opposed to resting internally inside of that fan assembly where you essentially could be impacting the overall performance of the thermal solution. So, so I've, had, I've had plenty of people with laptops come to me asking for help saying, my laptop overheats and I can't use it anymore. And I'll often find that, you know, if you open it up and you find where the fan is and you find where the heat sink is, this is just caked with dust. There's like yep. a layer of dust, so there's absolutely no air flowing through there. So I imagine that would help uh, alleviate that problem. Yeah, so definitely. I mean, there's still always you're going to want to be cautious and mindful, you know, of monitoring things. But this is kind of one of those things of trying to implement something that helps to just aid in, in ensuring better long term performance over time. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the actual manufacture of, of the chassis itself, sure. the shell. We actually have some sort of raw materials here, which yeah. I thought was fascinating to look at. So one of the cool things you'll notice is that this being an RG product, it's really kind of a premium product, a, a much higher grade in terms of the material composition. So most 
most of the time on most uh, gaming laptops, you're gonna find a lot of plastic, but on this unit, you're gonna actually have the predominant amount of metal that's gonna be on here. So aluminum and magnesium are pretty much par for the course. And this actually entire lid is milled from a single piece of aluminum, which you can actually see right here. So we actually have to use CNC uh, machining for this to be able to actually achieve this plate. And so this is actually an example of kind of like what you have right here. Uh, hopefully it's not too uh, too glossy right it's there. It's shiny. It is shiny. This entire process, to give you an example, this one essentially um, billet, it's gonna take over about 70 minutes mm -hmm. uh, on a CNC machine to wow. be able to actually machine out this one single piece. Um, then we have a dual anodization process which goes through to be able to give us different texture as well as the chamfered edges. Um, and that two-tone anodization which also is a nice little kind of gold hallmark that you find on the ROG series product. But even when you talk about other kind of materials and construction, uh, you know, we flip this over and we talk about the back of the unit. This is going to be a magnesium plate that you're going to have here as well. And, and that's done to be able to have, of course, something that's super lightweight. So this unit clocks in at just a little bit over 4.6 pounds. And it's really about trying to strike that balance of being able to maintain the right level of rigidity and strength, but also still have something that is truly light that when you throw it in your backpack, you don't feel like you're really taking on, you know, seven or eight pounds that you might traditionally have when you talk about these higher end quote unquote gaming laptops. Because yeah. this is a very capable gaming laptop when you talk about that eighth generation processor, that GTX 1070 Max-Q, right? It's a lot of performance to be able to fit into this type of design. And uh, I really like just the contrast between these two pieces. This piece of aluminum, or aluminum, for those of you over in the EU, uh, pretty substantial, pretty heavy. It's yeah. so much more lighter now that it's all milled and you can kind of see some of the uh, places here where the, the CNC went through and milled out everything. But still, like, I mean, this has a tiny bit of flex, yep. but really not much at all. Yep. Uh, and I, I just, it's so small, all the little grooves in there. Yeah, it's, it's a really impressive process. And I think it's, you know, just that attention to detail to be able to provide that quality. So, you know, as we kind of lake, uh, take a look through here in terms of the design constraints, um, and what we've kind of done here in terms of uh, dealing with the constraints of being thin and light. This had to be all one single piece to be able to maintain rigidity. That's important because this even ties into the Xiris experience that you have when you talk about the uh, the monitor, which is, excuse me, well, the, the the panel that's used on this. And that's important because that's really one of the hallmarks of this. This is, it has our super uh, narrow bezel design, and this is 144 hertz, three milliseconds panel. Ooh. We actually had to work directly with AUO, who's actually a panel manufacturer and have a very close relationship with ASUS, where we, they even had to actually work with another company called Merck, uh, which helps actually make some of the actual polymer material, which goes inside the actual LCD panel mm. to be able to achieve essentially all these operating specifications. So right now, ASUS is the only company that you'll find on the market that can offer you 144 hertz with three, three milliseconds response time. So it's again, this is kind of one of those challenges too. You know, if you were trying to build your own, you couldn't do this. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go directly to a company and request, hey, I want this ultra low response time, right? Uh, you might be forced to just get whatever is available on the market. And this is something that we've done in the past with like even our normal high-end, uh, you know, independent monitors where we had to co-work with the panel manufacturer to create specifications mm -hmm. that don't even exist in the market. And I think those are two extremely desirable uh, specs for a gaming monitor, whether you're talking about a laptop or a desktop. Um, the really high refresh rate and the really low response time. Yeah, it's, and it's... we were talking about bezels, not, you know, everybody has a different opinion, but it's nice to also be able to now have it with a, a super uh, narrow bezel-based design. And effectively, actually, when you talk about the overall volume or footprint, you've got this 15-inch uh, category-based notebook, but in a 14-inch chassis. Mm -hmm. So very impressive in that regard. And even in the color space performance, is actually quite nice. 100% sRGB coverage in terms of what you have there. So some cool stuff there. Now, one of the other things I think might be interesting is if we take a look here in terms of then down, we move down to the keyboard design and some kind of how do we have to account for doing things here. Even here, again, we have to figure out how do we maintain, I think, the, the quality of experience. So again, we go back to metal in terms of the framing for the entire keyboard. Mm -hmm. And that's because essentially because you have a much more compact space, you want to be able to have a good amount of still structural rigidity present so that as you're go ahead and depressing those keys that they feel substantial and that you can actuate clearly and consistently. And so even though specialized technology here we have called overstroke technology, which actually allows us to make sure that it's 50% uh, faster in terms of actually that register and that depression to be much more consistent so that even though you've got a reduced level of travel there, right, you're still getting an overall good keyboard experience. How do you turn the light? This has multi-zone RGB lighting yep. on the keyboard. So we should be able to go ahead and open up um, our, 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 
actually new software. We actually have RG Armory software, which is actually going to be replacing our uh, gaming center software. Now, just for some of you wondering, you know, as you guys guys might get some secondary shots here, you do want to keep in mind this is a engineering sample. Okay. So the final uh, version of this product is even going to be a little bit finer, sharper, and cleaner. Uh, you know, but um, we're you know we're giving you guys a first look preview right here in terms of just kind of what's going to be coming here. So here you can see that even though we've got this uh, compact keyboard, you still get your four zone RGB lighting. And this of course is fully supported in terms of Asus Aura Sync. So you can still synchronize this with everything from our keyboards, the mice, the headset, even some of our external items like, excuse me, external items like the ROG Spotlight or the ROG Terminal, mm -hmm. which allows you to even connect this to like USB port and still have LED strips for like your, your desk setup if you want to be able to do that stuff. So some cool things there. Um, we've got independent kind of layout here for your primary function keys and enlarged space bar base uh, setup in terms of that. And then of course, you've got the really interesting toggle based design for the touchpad and the numpad. So you can toggle off the numpad uh, when you want it and when you don't want it, you're good to go. And you still have full scissor based switches for your actual right click and your left click, which is nice because sometimes on these notebooks, you, especially as you go to more compact, sometimes you lose those buttons altogether and you just go with the touchpad uh, and you have to double press on it mm -hmm. or you don't have full actually mechanical base switches for the right click and the left click. So um, I think that in that regard, you still have a really, really nice premium experience here. Yeah, I think if switches are an option, I, I prefer having the physical switches there, but I do like the ability to, to pull up the numpad there too. Yeah. The numpad is like, when you need it, you really need it. Yeah, it just <laughs> makes things just more convenient. And, I, and mm -hmm. I think that's the key thing here is that that's one of those design challenges again. Um, you know, if you're probably trying to build your own, being able to develop something like this, which this again was kind of like a, a very industry unique based design implementation, it can be very challenging. And so that's always kind of the benefit. Um, you know, it's one of those kind of things that some users find challenging when you go about kind of the walled garden approach of designing something entirely internally, mm -hmm. but allows you to really try to maximize your engineering effort to be able to really design something distinctive and innovative, which I think definitely when you look at something like the Zephyrus, you, you know for a fact that that is the case. Right. Um, some other kind of cool updates that we've got for this generation here in terms of that RGB lighting is that we've also extended that lighting effect to the rear lighting, which you might not be able to see it as clearly here on the back, but those two zones will also still fully now support synchronization control, which our previous uh, generation Zephyrus didn't offer that synchronization and control. So you can kind of tie it all together within that. People, people need control over their RGB LEDs. Yeah, you, you definitely want it. You've got, of course, that RGB lighting right here, of course, on the ROGI as well on that guy. And uh, from a, an audio experience, I know that this is kind of something that we were talking about that was a little yeah. bit interesting as well. So one of the things here is um, on gaming notebooks as well, a lot of times you find that the speakers are gonna be downward firing, but actually here, they're actually directly placed within the hinge-based frame design, and they're actually front firing. So we've got two speakers there. They feature a smart amplifier. And what that does is it helps us to monitor temperature um, and excursion. Um, so that essentially makes sure that we can monitor the overall distortion level of the actual driver and the, the speaker. This allows us to maintain overall better just clarity and a better experience when you have with your speaker. So they pretty much you can go to the highest levels and you're not going to have to worry about blowing out, quote unquote, the speaker, which this was a little bit more of a problem uh, in previous generations of uh, notebooks. If you wanted to get kind of too aggressive, you could have an issue. Are, um, you, are you trying to kill the stigma of laptop speakers, JJ? Um, you know, I don't think you're ever going to go with it. You know, when you talk about speakers in general, you know, it's it's about mass and it's about how big you can go. So of mm -hmm. course, this is not going to replace, um, you know, a high quality headphone or high quality headset or external speakers. But I will definitely say that somebody who like me, who I think I really appreciate audio, um, it's definitely a passable experience. It's, it's quite solid um, and it's got a good level of tonality. But I think the cooler part is actually what we've done on the software side of the fence. Okay. Um, so let's yeah, plug in. Yep, let's go ahead and plug it in. So we're taking a look at software now, and this is probably another area that you'd have a little bit of a challenge setting up yourself at home, unless you're into software development and programming, <laughs> I guess. But having the software to play nice with the hardware in order to monitor temperatures, increase or decrease fan speeds, as well as do personalization stuff like changing lighting, sound configuration. I'm assuming all this is true, right, JJ? This yeah, is, that's yeah, what it actually it, does. This okay. is entirely part for the course, but I think kind of the more interesting part here as well is trying to kind of understand how users use their headphones and the different type of uh, audio, let's say connected devices, right? And so what we found is that we've always kind of implemented, I think a lot of really interesting sound technologies into our notebooks as well as even on our motherboards. But traditionally they're only going to be capable on um, an analog based connection. So if you had like an analog headset or an analog headphone, you were good to go. But what happens if you're using a USB headset, a USB DAC, and you're using VR, any of these other kind of pure digital based uh, devices, you were losing, I think a lot of the more customization options you might've had available. And so one of the cool things that we've done with Sonic Studio 
to 3, it uses APO injection, which allows us to essentially be able to go ahead and manipulate and customize uh, still all that, even if you're utilizing a USB headset or you're using VR or you're utilizing a USB DAC, you can still go in and customize things. So here you can see we're in the interface. We have different presets. So you can see you've got music, movie, gaming, communication. You've got things like smart volume, voice clarity, bass boost, treble. You've got an equalizer you can go ahead and customize. You can switch over to the advanced mode, which the advanced mode is cool because you actually can have what we call um, device routing and then per application or per game based customization. So example like here is that if I want, I could go to let's say all applications. You can see all your different applications. Uh, you can assign what you want the actual output to be on in terms of the device, in terms of what it's it's going to output the quote unquote audio to. And then from there, you can go ahead and customize, let's say your effects. So if you want to be able to set a specific mode. So whether it's like music or gaming, movies, you want to customize the EQ for each one of those, you can go ahead and apply all of those. And you can also do things like uh, spatialization. So if you want to apply like reverb or like surround sound mixing to any one of those, you can do that. And that's per any open application. So, you know, if you were going into a game, take for instance, there is Overwatch, you could customize Overwatch specifically, or you had browser, or you had Discord or Spotify, whatever it might be, you can go ahead and make those adjustments. And same thing even for the microphone, which is pretty cool. We have this technology here. You can see it's called On My Voice uh, and direct monitoring where we can do things like post-processing. We can stabilize volume. We can help to kind of improve voice clarity, minimize ambient noise interference. And this can, the cool thing about it is that it can work for incoming and outgoing audio. So yeah. if you've got kind of friends that are talking to you and you want to clean up their audio a bit, you can do that. But same thing, if you're, maybe your audio needs to be cleaned up a little bit, or maybe you've got a lot of, you got your AC running, you know, maybe in the same room, that you've happens, got a little bit of white noise, <laughs> right? You could leave that running, apply the actual post-processing. And I'll tell you from when I've tried it out, it's actually pretty good at really helping to eliminate those kind of consistent tones that you might have that are kind of more white noise, which are things like fans, ACs, hums that you might just mm -hmm. kind of have in your environment. It's a really nice level of software that's kind of built in. And, and I think we've all been like gaming and that person comes on the voice chat with like, you know, the $5 mic that, <laughs> that they got at the Walmart bargain bin or whatever, and it just sounds horrible. And you just want so, to be able to clean yeah. it up? You can, you can totally do that. Another option besides just muting them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, you, you don't want to mute your fan, especially if it's going to be affecting yeah, your, your opportunity in terms of hopefully winning. Oh, right? yeah. If you guys are playing a, a more competitive kind of map or something like that. Is key. So another big one is, uh, and we won't touch on it too much, but we actually have a brand new software suite that we call Armory Crate. And so you guys will be seeing a lot more of this later on, but this is actually a brand new over a software overhaul that we're going to have for um, Asus ROG based devices. So this will be your new kind of front end to be able to do everything like you were talking about. Hmm. You can make, you know, one touch adjustments so that if you want to be able to quickly make adjustments to your fan speeds, you can, you can switch from silent to balance the turbo. You can go ahead and see all your frequencies, your temperatures. You can have per game profiles. You can do process cleanup. So if you want to go ahead and get rid of a whole bunch of programs at one time so you can free up all your system resources. Mm -hmm. You've got mobile monitoring built in. So if you just want to kind of be focusing on your game, but then maybe still see your, your temperatures and other information on your smartphone or your tablet or something like that, you could load it up, kind of have it there off to the side so that you could be seeing your information in screen. Nice. That way, sometimes if you also don't want like an overlay that's running on your system, if you if your overlay is kind of eating up some of your HUD space or something like that, you don't have to worry about that. How does it connect to the uh, smartphone? Bluetooth. Just Bluetooth? Yep. Okay. Uh, Bluetooth-based connectivity. And you, you mentioned our other ROG products. Is this going to be coming to the desktop as well? Yes. Uh, you'll, we won't go too much into that, but you'll definitely be seeing more of Armory Crate in the future. Right. So you can definitely keep tuned that if you like this interface and if you guys have feedback on it, definitely drop it in the comments. I'll do my best to definitely try to pass that over to our team. Keep in mind, though, that everything we are talking about from the software and the hardware, this is an engineering sample. While most things are going to be pretty much uh, complete, there, there's always a little kind of subtle things that might, we're improving might on. Might be some slight modifications for the final launch. Yeah. Um, here, you know, Asus Aura Sync, like we've talked about, allows you to go ahead and have that control for your lighting, for any kind of uh, supported accessories as well would all show up in here as well. If you got, you know, keyboards, mice, headset, monitors, whatever it might be. Um, and then other, you know, options to be able to quickly launch, you know, things like XSplit, our uh, Game First Packet Variety software, so that if you want to customize the experience in terms of your network adapter for the wireless uh, or anything like that, you have that ability to be able to go ahead and do all those things. So a pretty nice uh, and comprehensive, I think, uh, software suite in here. And most of the software suite, really, I think that we focus on ROG is going to be about trying to really improve the overall gaming experience. And so a lot of that really translates into one being about networking, uh, because that's, of course, how you get online and play your games, and then on audio. And here you can see we are actually bringing up the brand new version. This is Game First 5, which you can go ahead and, and it actually, by default, will automatically detect the games that you have running and attempt to auto prioritize that. So let's say if I was jumping to Overwatch, it's going to set Overwatch automatically as the highest based item, hmm. and it'll send that prioritization. So if I've got other network centered services, I don't have to worry about that. But if I wanted to, I could go, you know, easily into manual, take for instance, and you could go in and you can manually set 
what you want to be at a higher level. Um, and you can even uh, have different networking adapters in here if you want to kind of change things up. You can go in and you can check your monitoring information. Um, there's even cool things like Wi-Fi analyzing built in so that if you want to check like which channels are the right channels to connect to, oh, that's nice. you can kind of see that information. Uh, you can see which applications are using the most bandwidth. So definitely I feel that, you know, it doesn't meet the, the quote unquote adage of being bloatware. I think this is actually useful, functional software that I think an enthusiast and a gamer would appreciate. Excellent. All right. So several different software options for you guys to control your Asus ROG laptop. I believe JJ brought another laptop though that we might want to take a, a quick look at. I did. So right. we've actually got something pretty special here. So we're unveiling another first. And this is going to be our 17 inch version of our Strix uh, nice. SCAR 2. And so um, the SCAR series is really kind of our series that has been focused at kind of uh, esports gamers or kind of that mid range enthusiast. So people that really want to hit that kind of sweet spot in terms of bang for the buck. So they still want something that's got great build quality, high level of performance, eighth generation based processor, uh, GTX 1060 in terms of the graphics card, still an extremely impressive thermal solution. Um, you know, still all that same software that we've talked about, um, you know, overstroke technology, um, nice high quality, I think finishes here. You're not dealing with metal, but we do have actually a special eight layer of what's called IMR process, which helps to really add subtle textures and details into the kind of the fit and finish. And I think a really immersive and impressive base unit as well, because this is going to be same thing, 144 Hertz, three millisecond response time, nice. but with super thin bezels as well. So those super narrow bezels, they really add like a whole nother level of additional immersion uh, when you talk about having a 17 inch, but pretty much in a 15 inch kind of body. So I think that was the other thing that we kind of see as kind of something that's similar between the Zephyrus and the Strix is kind of giving you a more compact base uh, laptop, but still an extremely high level of performance with some really cool design elements. Yeah, we, we were talking as we were preparing for the video that I used to have an Asus G73, which yeah. is an old school, big old desktop replacement. And that was a 17, 17 inch, I think 17.3. This by comparison is so much smaller and also so much lighter yep. uh, relative to that. And you still got a very nice size screen. Yeah, and uh, you know, you get a couple of, of course, uh, upgrades that you would expect when you go to a bigger chassis. So you're gonna have a little bit more connectivity in terms of the total number of ports. You get an SD card slot as well as on, on this unit, which you wouldn't have on this model. Now, one thing that we didn't also touch on and just kind of for some of you are wondering, which is another little cool point that we were talking about, Paul, I know you've always had like a little bit of a appreciation, I think for some Wi-Fi technology and stuff like that. I like is that both of these actually feature the latest generation Intel Wave 2 811 AC wireless chips at built-in board. And the reason why that's important is because if you have a multi-user MIMO compatible based router, these are multi-user MIMO compatible based clients. So that can even offer a higher level of performance um, that combined with the speed throughput of the chipset means that you can legitimately be seeing 500, 600, 700, 800 megabits of wireless throughput. So you're talking, you know, five to almost nine times the actual throughput of 10, 100 ethernet, almost true gigabit class Wi-Fi. Um, so if you're talking about low latency, um, you know, low ping and just overall high performance wireless gaming, you can definitely achieve that with these units. Um, the other uh, really cool thing here on this Strix unit is it features a specialized design that we call range boost, where traditionally on most notebooks, you have a fixed number of antennas. Um, so it might be like a two by two antenna configuration. This actually features more than two antennas. And the benefit of that is what it does is it helps to monitor kind of the location and the signal strength and it can switch to the antenna that is receiving better performance. Um, so it's a, it's a so exclusive it's like, technology. You can't use all there. four at the same time, but it just switches to whichever one is physically in a exactly, better Exactly, in a better location to give you better okay. performance. So while it doesn't necessarily have the same premium, ultra premium implementations that you're gonna have here, like on something like on the Zephyrus S, you still get a very capable, high performance, high quality based uh, gaming laptop. So some pretty cool stuff, I think, if, you know, if you're talking about, and, and hopefully you've gotten a little bit more kind of an insight. There are definitely a lot of challenges when you go about putting in this much performance when you talk about the CPU, the GPU, uh, the layout for the keyboard design, you know, the rigidity and all those different elements on how you kind of try to make them work, you know, all holistically to be able to provide a, you know, stable, reliable and high performance experience. And it's a combination of all those things. It's not just the thermal design. It's not just the panel design. It's not just the specification implementation. There's, you know, it's kind of some of the parts experience kind of thing. And if I can ask you one last question that you might not be able to answer, as this year of 2018 progresses, we're expecting some upcoming launches on the CPU and GPU side. Is it reasonable to assume that these uh, SKUs will be updated with that updated hardware if and when it becomes available? So I, I can't go too much into essentially any products that haven't been discussed or formally announced or uh, planned out. Um, but what I can tell you is that these designs that you see here, uh, we have designed essentially um, as kind of our, our uh, 
designs to move forward in the future with, and they do have headroom support for what might be coming down. I think that was a safe enough answer, but hopefully you guys know more about uh, the upcoming stuff from Asus. JJ, this has been awesome. Thanks for stopping by again. No, thanks for having me, and definitely, I'd love to hear your guys' feedback. You know, we know that always uh, there's a lot of different opinions on what's the right design, what's the right ports, what's the right type of specifications, but um, I think that we've really done um, a great job at being able to try to provide two outstanding experiences, you know, something in that mid-range and then something in the ultra premium and the, you know, something really impressive with this, the world's thinnest uh, gaming laptop here with the Zephyrus S. Um, and that's, and that's all, actually one last thing that I did want to touch on that I think oh, we yeah. did forget to mention here that the Zephyrus is really formally kind of part of a family of products. So some of you might be seeing that there's other Zephyrus models. That's going to continue to exist. Uh, Zephyrus is really all about defining the expectation of what the best is uh, in a gaming laptop when it comes to that ultra thin and light, but gaming class notebook category or gaming class laptop category. So there are three models. You've got the traditional Zephyrus, um, then the Zephyrus M, and now the Zephyrus S. Um, so each one kind of is a little bit different than the other, kind of the S being the slimmest, the M being that balance of giving you the desktop class GPU part with a little bit more storage expansion and a, a traditional keyboard layout. And then the original Zephyrus, which has the non-traditional keyboard layout like this uh, base design and a 1080 Max-Q base design, but a little bit thicker. So each one kind of to different users uh, that are out there. there, there's the Zephyrus for you. All right, well guys, uh, this has been a quick first look at the, well, quick, quick probably isn't the right word, but an in-depth look at the new Asus ROG Zephyrus S coming soon, or actually coming soon or available now? Do we know? Coming, coming very soon. Coming very soon. And also a quick look at the Asus ROG Strix uh, SCAR 2 available right here, 17 inch variety. Guys, uh, thank you so much for watching this video and hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it. And JJ, thanks again for stopping by today. Thanks for having me. All right, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one.